So here we go. Uh, no, that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to go over here. So give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen, which says it just shows our Canvas homepage of our class. Okay, all right. Thanks, Blake. Okay, I got one thumbs up. I'll take it. So this is our classes um, page on Canvas. Now I'm in instructor view right now. When you guys log in, it probably looks more like like this. Okay, so this is more what you see. But you can see that we have syllabus and schedule contact information, how to access McGraw-Hill Connect. All of the lecture slides are already available for the entire semester. They're already up there. And you can see that you scroll down. Here's our Learn Smart assignment. So if you're wondering where to access those, you just click on the Learn Smart once you've registered with McGraw-Hill Connect, which virtually everybody has. So we're good on that. If you scroll down a little bit farther than that, you can see the homework assignments. Um, I don't know why I'm not seeing homework one right now. Is there a reason for that? Anyhow, if there is, I'll rectify it after class. Okay, then you can see I also have a bunch of practice exams. Um, so practice exam one is already up there. It requires respondents. I highly, highly, highly recommend doing the practice exam before tackling the real exam. You know, um, not to sound like a meanie. I don't like to come off sounding like a, a mean person or anything, but oftentimes when we get messages from students that get that don't get the grades that they want on the first exam we'll go back and we'll look and say did they try the practice exam and more often than not they will not have done that so again the practice exam is very similar in scope and content um, it's exactly the same in content as the real exam but it's similar in scope as well yes you can take a practice exam more than once i also have a handout and periodic table for exam one for for the first exam and for the first practice exam. Anyhow, and then I also have a link there to some lecture videos. And of course, I will try to record all the lectures as we move on. All right. Yes, McGraw-Hill um, Connect is, is synced with um, Canvas. So once you complete something in McGraw-Hill Connect, it goes into your grade. So I can see it gets uploaded immediately. All right. So there you have it. That's a little bit about um, that's a little bit about uh, the about Canvas. And somebody just asked, how do you get Respondus? All of the instructions on how to download Respondus and to use Respondus, they are all found in the syllabus towards the end of the syllabus, or maybe it's in the middle. I forget, but they're all in there. There's even a link to a nice YouTube video that you can watch that provides you with all kinds of details about Respondus. Okay, so it's in the syllabus. All right, so I'm gonna leave my student view here for a second and I'm gonna come back to my teams, to you guys. And yeah, so here we go. And let's open up our slides right here. Yeah, let's open up our slides. So let's try to find where we left off last class. And I think it was somewhere around SI units right around here and before we get into that um i just want to remind you that if i was in your shoes what would i be doing if you're wondering you know like i'm in this class i hear about learn smarts and homeworks and all this but what should i really be focusing on so if i was you the first thing i would do is i would go into the textbook and i would look in chapter one and in chapter two and in chapter three and after reading it i would try some practice problems in the back of the book. So I would try some practice problems and I would do that before I attempt maybe doing the homework. Okay. Then once you've completed the homework, I try to do even more practice problems and then, you know, tackle the practice exam, so on and so forth. Because the best way to master chemistry, especially general chemistry, is to practice, practice, practice. I just got offline with my organic chemistry two class. So they this is all of their, at least their fourth chemistry class that they've taken. And if you were to talk to any of them or stop them on the street, I'm sure that all of them would tell you the same thing, that in order to be successful and to get that far in chemistry, you really have to do lots of practice. It's not a subject that comes naturally to uh, very many people, if anyone, okay? Um, it's something that just requires a lot of practice. All right, so let's get started on SI base units. I'm going to go over some math problems today. We're going to look at dimensional analysis. We're going to look at um, units, of course, like uh, units for temperature and mass and length and things like density. 
And we're going to talk about the imperial system, which is still used in the United States for measurement. And we're also going to talk about the metric system. All right. So let's get started by talking about SI, the SI system. And there are many ways of measuring um, substances and many ways to measure matter. But what we like to use in chemistry is to use SI units. And SI stands for a system. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. And SI stands for Système International, which is French for the International System. And the International System is a system of units that is widely accepted and used by the scientific community for measuring um, matter. And so um, we have the base units for the um, International System shown here in this table. And we have base units for mass, length, time, temperature, amount of substance, and also current and luminous intensity. Now the ones that we're going to be most concerned with in chemistry class are going to be mass, length, time, temperature, and amount of substance. And the base unit for mass is the kilogram, which is abbreviated kg. The base unit for length is the meter. It's lowercase m for time is the second. I'm sure you're all aware of that one. For temperature, some of you may or may not have heard of Kelvin, the Kelvin scale, and we'll talk about that this morning. And we use the capital or uppercase K for that. And for an amount of substance, we use the mole. Now, I'm sure that many people here have been introduced to the mole in high school or maybe in an introductory chemistry class. But if you haven't, no fear. We will be talking about the mole in gross detail later on. And you can see that we can use these units okay, that are shown here. Now, the reason I'm not mentioning or I'm not really going into detail about Amperes and candelas is because we don't really use them a whole lot in this class, if at all. What you can do with these units is that you can derive all other units from these base units. Let's say we're talking about speed, okay? And speed is measured in what? Oops, let me get a better pen than that. Speed is measured in meters per second. Well, good news. We have meters and seconds here. So any units that we want to use can always be derived from the base units. Before we move on to the next slide, I just want to point out one other thing, is that none of these um, unit names have a prefix except for the kilogram. It's the only one that has a prefix. So um, if you've been introduced to the metric system before in SI units, you might think, okay, well, mass, wouldn't the base unit be the gram? No, as a matter of fact, it's actually the kilogram, and kilo is a prefix, and I'll talk more about that in a second. I'll give you another one that's kind of a funny one, which is the amount of substance, the mole, which is spelled M-O-L-E. It's abbreviation. Are you ready for this? It's M-O-L, right? Pretty good abbreviation, huh? You just get to leave out one letter. Anyhow, let's move on from there, and let's talk about common decimal prefixes that are used with SI units. And so if we were to take a base unit, like let's say um, a meter, we can add these prefixes, and then the, we can add the exponential notation to uh, determine the amount of, let's say, we take a meter and we want to have a, a kilometer or a kilometer. Son of a gun. Sorry, I don't know why I did that. Put it back here. Anyhow, let's say we have a, a, a meter and then we want to have a kilometer. We're going to take that meter and we're going to multiply it by a thousand. So if we have a thousand meters, we have a kilometer. If we were to have a million meters, okay, again, a meter is a base unit that we had on the previous slide, then we'd have a megameter, right? If we had one, um, one, one hundredth of a meter, right, like that's shown here, then we would have a centimeter. If you had a thousandth, you'd have a millimeter, so on and so forth. Now, you might be wondering, why are some of these highlighted, or sorry, why are some of these in bold and some of them are not. The reason why is because the ones that are given to you in bold, we want you to have those ones memorized. And if you're wondering, no, I have to know, you know, mega and kilo and deci and centi and milli and micro and nano and pico, do I have to know that for the first exam? Well, I will give you these ones for the first exam, but it's going to be kind of like training wheels that I'll rip the training wheels off after the first exam. So after the first exam, you will be expected to know the prefixes and the um, uh, and what they mean um, for 
the ones that I have highlighted in yellow or the ones that are shown in bold. OK, so I'll provide those for the first exam only. And if you're thinking, well, Mr. Dion, that sounds really difficult. Well, the more practice problems that you do, the more accustomed you come to you to using these pre prefixes and the simpler they get. OK, so we go from large, large to small. And you can see that you have to know more that are kind of on the small side than on the large side. Anyhow, this is one of those slides that I could sit here and ramble on probably and could probably talk about it for the next 10 minutes. But in the interest of time, let's keep moving and we're going to look at several examples where we apply these prefixes and the exponential notations involved with those. Let's talk about common SI to English equivalent quantities. So if you grew up in America and you were educated in this country, I wasn't, I did all my education in Canada. Um, you're probably aware of some of these um, conversions already. So if we take a look at something like, I don't know, let's start with a meter. OK, if we have a meter, a meter is about the same length as a yard. You can see right here that it's actually a little bit longer than a yard. It's 1.094 yards. OK, well, a meter is 100 centimeters. I already told you that this morning. OK, and let me just get my object eraser. There we go. Now, the conversion from yards to meters, which is shown right here, here that one yard is equal to 0.9144 meters or you know if you want to know a mile is 1.609 um, kilometers you will not have to memorize any of those okay so if I ever ask you to convert something from an English or what is sometimes called the imperial system to SI units so any of these conversions here I will always provide you with those now I'm sure that many of you have a knowledge of some of these already but you don't have to memorize any of these. If you need them to solve a problem, I will provide them for you. OK, so let's see. We covered the meter. What else? Let's just look at some fun ones that are kind of interesting. Um, one cubic centimeter is son of a gun. Sorry, technical difficulties here. There we go. Um, what else? Um, yeah, let's just move on. We're going to get to practice to use these a bunch of times this morning. This picture here just shows you some volume relationships in the um, international system of units. So we have down here, if you look at the really small, the small length here. So this is a millimeter. Now, this is probably not to scale on your screen. It's just to give you a, an idea of how big is a cubic centimeter versus a cubic millimeter versus a cubic decimeter. That's all they're really trying to show you here. But um, there are 2.54, so I can help you out here. If you know what an inch is, there are 2.54, roughly two and a half centimeters in one inch. Okay, so this right here is represents one centimeter. And you can see that one centimeter has 10 millimeters in it, right? Because if this is a millimeter, right, you can see we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And in fact, we could write that down in here that one centimeter is equal to 10 millimeter so if i have a cubic centimeter it's one centimeter by one centimeter by one centimeter and if i have 10 centimeters right 10 centimeters 10 centimeters that's equal to one decimeter and if i take one decimeter and multiply it by one decimeter and one decimeter what do i have i have a thousand centimeters cube cube right that's what we have in here total is we have one thousand centimeters cube if you were to add up all of these squares that you see here, right, you'd have 100. You're missing one here. It would be 99 plus that one. But that would be 100, and then you multiply that by 10, and you end up with 1,000 centimeters cubed. So you can see that 1 times 1 times 1, if I take 1 decimeter, multiply by 1 decimeter, multiply by 1 decimeter, I end up with 1 decimeter cubed. And so one decimeter cubed is equal to 1,000 centimeters cubed. What else is this equal to? It's also equal to one liter, and that's shown right here. So one liter is equal to one decimeter cubed, one decimeter cubed, which is equal to 1,000 centimeters cubed. And again, if you understand what an inch is, or if you know what an inch is, and you know that the conversion that this, is that there's roughly two and a half centimeters in one inch. Well, it can kind of give you an idea of how big a liter is. Let me give you some other approximations here. So if you know what a pint is, if you've ever ordered a pint of Coke or something, 
at a bar? Well, a pint is two cups and a pint is roughly half a liter. So if you had two pints, you'd have about a liter. Another conversion that might be handy for you is that um, one gallon is close to four liters. It's about 3.78 liters. So if you've ever seen a gallon of milk, that's about, that's roughly four liters, a little less than four liters in there. Again, as you practice and do more and more work with um, scientific or international um, units, you'll get more and more accustomed to these kind of um, uh, unit conversion. How do we measure volumes? Well, this again is one of those slides that I could sit here and talk about for quite a while, but we measure volumes in the lab using volumetric glassware. And there are different types of volumetric glassware. Um, these two pieces of glassware here, these are called volumetric flasks. So these are volumetric flasks. And you can actually read a volumetric flask to two decimal places. In fact, there's only one line, there's only one measurement marking on the entire flask. Um, and you might think, well, that's kind of dumb. You make a piece of glassware and it's only got one line on it. Yeah, but the reason why it's only got one line is because it's, it's highly calibrated for that one line. So it's kind of hard to see this. If you blow this up, it looks like that's a 500 milliliter um, volumetric flask. So that means when the meniscus, the bottom of this liquid that's shown here, when it's right on that line, you have 500.00 milliliters. So you know that with great accuracy. Other pieces of equipment here, this is called a burette. A burette, you would use those a lot in general chemistry too. Um, this one here is called a volumetric, a volumetric pipette, okay? The same thing as the, um, as the volumetric flask, it's literally got one marking on it, so only one. And down here we have a beaker, a beaker. And over here we have graduated cylinders. So these are graduated cylinders. And then we got one more. Can anybody name this one here? This one that I have circled in green. Could anybody name this one that's in green? Yeah, Jonah and Violet said it's the Erlenmeyer flask. Absolutely right. So this is the Erlenmeyer. Erl Erlenmeyer. Okay. There we go. So those are common types of glassware that are, you spelled it close enough that are used to measure volumes in the lab. All right. On the right, we have what's called. Um, an auto pipetter, an automatic pipetter. I like to use, or normally I use the trade name, which is, they're usually made by a company called Eppendorf. So sometimes we just call them Eppendorf pipettes. It's just like people use the word Kleenex instead of a tissue. Anyhow, but these are pipettes that are calibrated, that are also highly accurate, and are really good for measuring um, the same volume over and over and over. So say you want to, you know, measure up five milliliters, you know, 10 or 100 times, you can do it very quickly with um, an auto pipette. But anyhow, before we move on, I'll just address the fact that there are people in the other meeting right now. So those people, I'm, it's, we're moving on right now. So I'll just reply to them right now. We are in the other meeting. Okay. So what I would say to you guys is from now on, um, always let me start the meeting. So I will always create the meeting and then I will start the meeting and then you should join that meeting, the one that I start. I would love to come to class 20 minutes early or a half an hour early so that I can be the first one here, but I have lecture until 9.15 and so it doesn't give me a lot of time to start the new meeting, but always, I will always start the meeting ahead of class a little bit so then you can join that meeting. All right, let's move on to the next slide. This slide is kind of an FYI slide it shows you different quantities of length volume and mass um it just gives you some um, um perspective on different sizes so if we look at you know something like the size of a normal adult breath so let's just start with volume which is in the middle okay and we'll just look at the volume for now this is the size of a normal adult breath is around 10 liters 10 to the power of zero is 10 and so um yeah, 10 liters, and you can see that you go up a little bit from that. You have the, uh, the amount of blood that's in the average human, and you can see the volume of the oceans and seas in the world is 
much higher, somewhere between 10 to the power of 21 and 10 to the power of 24. You go all the way down here to something really small, like the volume of a typical bacterial cell, which is really small. It's probably around 10 to the negative 14 or something like that, liters. The whole purpose behind this slide is really just so that you have an idea of what volumes, masses, and lengths mean, okay? So if I ask you, you know, what's the length of, a, of, a, of an adult, the average adult's, you know, shoe in, in meters, and if you put, well, it's probably 10 to the power of 12 meters or something like that, okay? Well, that's insane, okay, because that's the distance from the Earth to the sun. Now, I'm sure a lot of you are, like, smiling or smirking right now and being like, well, that's kind of ridiculous. But you'd be surprised as a teacher. Sometimes you'll have students that really have no idea what these units mean. And so all it's good to do here is really take a look at this slide and make sure you have an idea of what different masses mean. So if you have 100 grams, you should have an idea of what 100 grams is, right? 100 grams is a little bit more than a third of a pound, for example, right? If you have 100 kilograms, you should at least have an idea. I don't mean you have to be super close, but you should have an idea of what's reasonable for 100, for 100 kilograms, right? right? Let's say like a football player might weigh around 100 kilograms. That would be perfectly reasonable, okay? So just have a reasonable idea of um, different lengths, volumes, and masses as we move forward. All right, let's get into my favorite part of the lecture, which is problem solving. What I really enjoy about this chapter, it says here that all measured quantities consist of a number and a unit. And I can prove that to you if I was to, you know, come on line with you guys in the morning and say, hey, you won't believe what I did last night. I caught a fish and it was six. You're like, what? And I'd be like, yeah, it was six, man. It was, it was huge. It was six. And you're like, okay, was it six inches? Was it six you know, was it six feet long? Was it uh, six millimeters? You know, you got to give me some more information there, bud. So not only do we need a number, we also need a unit, right? I can give you another example. I'm going to give you, look, I, I have some money to give you. Really? You got some money for me? Yes, I have some money. I'm going to give you 25. Okay. Is that 25 cents? Because if so, I'm not super excited. But if it's 25,000, I'll take it, right? So units are going to be very, very important. And units are manipulated the same way that we manipulate numbers. Let's take a look at an example here. And this is probably a review for most people who are hearing my voice right now. But if we look at this example here, it says 3 feet times 4 feet gives you 12 feet squared. Well, what did we do? Obviously, we multiplied 3 times 4, which is equal to 12. But we also multiplied feet times feet. Now, feet times feet don't give you 12. What do they give you? They give you feet to the power of two, okay? And the reason you know that is because you would have learned in math class that feet to the power of one and feet to the power of one, when we multiply things that are to the first exponent, to the exponent of one, we simply add those to get feet squared. Let's take a look at this example down here. So again, we're, multi we're, sorry, we're manipulating units the same way we manipulate numbers. It says here that 350 miles in seven hours, we could reduce that down to 50 miles in one hour. If you just divide 350 by seven, you get 50. But we could also express these units, right? Miles in our numerator and hours in our denominator. We could also express it as 50 miles times hours to what? The power of negative one. Because when we have to the power of negative one, it's the same thing as saying one over that unit. So it's the same thing as saying one over hour. Okay, give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that one. Not meant to be a mind boggler. <laughs> Anybody follow me on that one? All right, good. I didn't scroll down. I see that I got like a million thumbs up. Tyler just wrote thumb. I like it. I like it. I dig that. Okay. Yeah. So you'll have to forgive me, you guys. Sometimes it's kind of hard for me. So I have my eye on three things at once. Normally when I'm lecturing, I have my eye on what? I have my eye on my notes, the podium, and then I'll have it on, you know, my students who are in front of me. But here I kind of have it on my iPad. 
then on my notes and I'm trying to look at my laptop as well, which is where I have the chat. So I'm doing my best, but I appreciate that. I see Naden, Emily, Aaron, the thumbs up. I really appreciate that. That's great. So, all right. If there's one person who doesn't understand, so somebody says there's one person who doesn't understand, well, we're going to have to move on. So I just want to get a feel for if some people understand and the vast majority do. Now, you might be thinking, well, that's cruel of you, Mr. Dion. One person doesn't understand. But if you don't understand, what would the best mode of attack be? It would be to go back to the textbook and reread what I covered. Okay. Remember, chemistry is a content driven class. Okay. And we have a lot of content to get through over the course of the semester. So I won't be able to stop. If there's a specific problem, if somebody has a specific question, I can definitely address that question. All right, but I cannot reteach the same content over and over and over. We definitely don't have time for that. All right, so it says here that a conversion factor is a ratio of equivalent quantities that's used to express a quantity in different units. And we use conversion factors all the time in our day-to-day -day life. So it says here, the relationship that one mile is equal to 5,280 feet gives us the conversion factor that in one mile, there's 5,280 feet, right? And I put here 5280 magazine. I'm sure you're all avid readers of that magazine. We could also write a conversion factor, right? We could write that in 5,280 feet, there is one mile, right? Either way, it's the same thing, okay? We can still do that, okay? Um, so conversion factors are going to be used all the time in this class, okay? Another conversion factor, you know, that you would use maybe every day is how many quarters are there in a dollar, right? You know that in one dollar, you've got four quarters. How many eggs are there in a dozen? You know that in one dozen, there are 12 eggs. So we use conversion factors constantly in our day-to-day -day lives. And with that in mind, let's take a look at a problem that involves conversion factors it says here that the height of Angel Falls is 3,212 feet. Express this quantity in miles if one mile is equal to 5,280 feet. So you can see that I gave you a conversion factor. So if it's not a uh, conversion factor that's in the metric system, I will provide that for you. Okay, so what do we need to do here? We are given the height in feet and we want to convert it into miles. So let's get this thing set up. I like to use what's called dimensional analysis, and I'm sure that many of you are familiar with dimensional analysis. And so we're going to start it with what we're given. And we're given 3,212 feet. Okay. And we want to end up with the number of miles. Okay. So you can see that right away we have the wrong units. We have the units of feet, and we need to multiply that by something so that we can get rid of feet. And in that conversion factor, we would want to have feet in our denominator so that we could cancel out the numerator of what we are given. Well, looky, looky, we just so happen to have a conversion factor that fits the bill because we know that there are 5,280 feet in one, mi one mile. And so not only did we cancel out the units of feet, but we're also left with our desired units, which are miles. So if you grab your calculator, I have mine here. I like to use a Texas Instruments that cost me, I think, $12 Canadian. I bought it in Canada. So if it was $12 Canadian, it's probably like six cents US. So I take 32.12 and I divide it by 52.80. And when I do that, I get this big long number and I will discuss um, significant figures later on in the class, probably today. But anyhow, when you multiply that, you end up with 0 0.6083 miles. And there is our final answer like that. All right, there we go. So let's move on from there. In my slides that are posted to Canvas, I always leave, or sorry, sometimes I have the solutions in the, in the problems and sometimes I don't, depending on the problem. But anyhow, let's move on and try another problem that involves conversion factors. But this time we're going to do a problem that involves more than one conversion factor. All right. So it says here, to wire your stereo equipment, you need 325 centimeters of speaker wire that sells for 15 cents per foot. What is the price of the wire? Well, here the author of our textbook has devised a plan that we can follow 
to solve this problem. She says, okay, well, we're starting out with the length of wire in centimeters, and we want to get the price, and we're given the price per foot. So what's the first thing we're going to have to do is convert the length of that wire into feet, okay? And instead of going directly from centimeters to feet, she uses several conversion factors. She uses the conversion factor that in 2.54 centimeters, there's one inch, and then in 12 inches, there's one foot. After we use those two conversion factors, we'll have determined the length of the wire in feet, and then we can simply multiply it by this conversion factor here, knowing the price per foot, and we can end up with the price. Now, in my solution, or in the solution that I have posted in the next couple slides, it, it does it step by step by step. Okay, so it does one step, then the next step, then the next step, then the next step. I don't think that is the best way to do these kind of problems. I think the best way to solve these kind of problems is using dimensional analysis. Dimensional analysis. Okay, so dimensional analysis is an extremely powerful tool to solve problems like this. So let's start out with what we know. Okay, and what we know is that we're starting with 325 centimeters. Okay, and we're trying to get to the price of what the wire would be. And so the first thing we need to do, like I said, is to convert that length into feet. And the conversion factors we're going to use are this one first. Okay, so we're going to use the conversion factor that there's 2.54 centimeters in one inch. That's where we're going to start. So centimeters and centimeters are going to cancel out. If I was to stop right here, if I was to put an equal sign, what would my units be? They would be inches. That's not what I want. I need feet because I know the price of the wire in cents or dollars rather per feet. Okay. So with that in mind, we have to use another conversion factor. How am I going to get rid of the units inches? Look at this. I have another conversion factor. I know that in 12 inches, I have one foot. Now you can see that my inches, which are in my numerator, are going to cancel out with inches in my denominator. Again, if I was to stop right here, I'd have the number of feet. But I've also been given another conversion factor, which is shown down here at the bottom, which is that in one foot, or sorry, yes, in one foot, it costs $0.15 or 15 cents. Okay? And so let's use that last conversion factor is that it's zero point one five dollars, right? Which is the same thing as 15 cents for one foot. And there you have it. So now the units of feet are going to cancel out. Look, this isn't magic. What have we done in this equation that we've set up? We've canceled out centimeters and we canceled our inches. We canceled feet. And what are we left over with? The price of the wire. And so when we multiply all of that out in our calculator, we end up with a dollar sixty is what it costs us. Okay? So the price is one dollar and sixty cents. All right. Now like I told you, I like to put the solutions um in the slides as well so you can take a look at another way of solving the problem sometimes. Now this way works as well. I don't think this way is nearly as elegant or as quick, um, where at first you solve for the number of inches, then you solve for the number of feet, and then you solve for the price. It will work, you know, it works, that's, that's totally fine. And our exams are multiple choice, so you have the freedom to solve the problem in whichever way you want. But you can see how if you set it up all in one fell swoop, that the problem gets solved, what I, what I think is a little bit quicker and with a little more elegance. Let's try another one. Who's juiced? Who's ready to try another problem? Somebody said yay. Heck, heck yeah. All right, good. Somebody says me. Okay, let's try another one. Okay, let's do it. Somebody says woo. All right. This is this is actually kind of funny. All right, let's do it. Okay. All right. My organic chemistry students, they like to tease me sometimes and they put on these memes and stuff. I don't get it. I'm too old, but whatever. Anyhow, um, let's see here. Let's try problem 1.4. Um, um, dum, 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 dum. Good presenter shouldn't say um. um 
Okay, let's read it. It said, a graduated cylinder contains 19.9 milliliters of water. When a small piece of galena, which is an ore of lead, is added, it sinks and the volume increases to 24.5 milliliters. What is the volume of the piece of galena in centimeters cubed and liters? Well, what you're doing is you're taking your graduated cylinder, and I'm sure that you're all way ahead of me on this. And you're like, Mr. Dion, I know what the heck is going on in the problem. Okay, I get it. You're taking the graduated cylinder, okay, and we got some water in it, okay, all right, and it's at this level, okay, which is what is it, 19.9 milliliters. And hey, can I do this? Would this work? Try something here. Copy. Paste, boom, and what if I, oops, I didn't mean to do that. There we go, what if I pixel erase it? There we go. So then what they're doing is they're dropping the galena in it. So the galena, put the galena there, whatever, not the scale, okay? And then they, when they drop it in, the volume of water is gonna go up, right? By displacement. And so the new volume is 24.5 milliliters. Well, it's not, it shouldn't be that much of a stretch to tell you that the change in volume, I'm gonna use the triangle to represent delta, which is the Greek symbol for um, uppercase D, and we just use that to represent change. The difference in volume is gonna equal the final volume minus the initial volume, right? So that's gonna be equal to 24.5 milliliters subtract 19.9 milliliters. Oh, jeepers, where's my calculator? Um, I can do that in my head. It's 4.6. So 4.6 milliliters, okay? So there's our delta V. I'm kind of running out of space here, so I'm going to go to the next slide. Okay, but anyhow, we figured out that our delta V, our difference in volume, delta V is equal to the V final minus the V initial, which was 24.5 milliliters subtract 19.9 milliliters which equals to 4.6 milliliters now what conversion factor do we need to convert that volume into centimeters cubed or liters well i bet you you all or some people might remember this one that one one milliliter is equal to one centimeter cube so we can do that one pretty quickly we can say that we have 4.6 milliliters and we can multiply that by this conversion factor that in one milliliter we have one centimeter cubed. And so milliliters are gonna cancel out and we end up with 4.6, 4.6 centimeters cubed like that. I know that there's some of you, um, I know there's some of you online who are thinking right now, like Mr. Dion, I, you didn't need to do that. You didn't have to multiply by one over one. I knew what the answer was in my head. There's, there's no problem. If you wanna solve a problem in your head, you do that as long as you get the right answer. I'm a happy, very happy camper, okay? But, um, you know, as an instructor, I'm kind of obliged to show you the mechanics behind things. So let's just take a look at how would we convert that volume in milliliters to, to liters? Well, you can use this conversion factor here. So the way that he did it is he said one milliliter is equal to 10 to the negative three liters, but that's kind of, or I shouldn't say he, it's a she who is the author of the textbook. Anyhow, that's kind of a funny way of doing it since um, on that slide with that big cube that I showed you earlier, it said that one, one of a gun, my pen. yeah, it said that 1,000 um, milliliters was equal to one liter. Either way, this and this are the exact same conversion factor, but I like to use big numbers rather than, or numbers that are greater than one, like 1,000 rather than 10 to the minus three. It's just simpler to me. So the way I would set this problem up then is I would say, okay, well, if I have 4.6 milliliters and I use my conversion factor that there's 1,000 milliliters in one liter, well, looky, looky, milliliters cancel out. And what am I left over with? I'm left over with liters as my unit. So 4.6 divided by 1,000. I mean, there's a couple of ways you could write this. You could say 0 0.0046 liters, that, that works. If you know what scientific notation is, and hopefully you do, since you have a number that's less than one, you move the decimal place to the right, you would move it one, two, three times like this, and you would say, this is the same thing as 4.6 times 10 to the negative three 
leaders. Either way, they both mean the same thing. So there you have it. That's another conversion. Okay. And there's the convert. There's the solution that I had put in my slides. Let's do another one. Who's enjoying this? Anybody enjoy a little bit of problem solving on a Wednesday? Oh, wow. Good. That's great. Fantastic. I do too. I really do. I like doing some uh, chemistry on a Wednesday morning. It's, it's fun. Uh, let's try Let's try one more and then we'll talk about density for a little bit. Yeah, why don't we do that? And then after that, we'll talk about temperature to wrap up this chapter. All right, let's do this one. I'm going to go a little bit quicker here. What did somebody say? I like it when I'm right. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Anyhow, somebody says, do you prefer scientific notation? I prefer the right answer. Okay. The answer just has to be correct. That's all it has to be. When we will use, um, a Maddie, the, when scientific notation becomes really, really important in this class is when you're working with really big numbers and really small numbers. Okay. That's, that's when scientific notation really comes into its own. But let's try one more problem. It says a furniture factory needs 31.5 feet squared of fabric to upholster one chair. Sounds exciting. It's Dutch supplier. I don't know why Dutch is important, but anyhow, it's Dutch supplier sends the fabric in bolts that hold exactly 200 meters squared. How many chairs can be upholstered with three bolts of fabric? Well, we have our roadmap here on the right. Um, we have our roadmap here on the right with all of the different conversion factors that in one bolt, there's 200 meters squared. In fact, I didn't even know that until I read this book a couple of years ago. I didn't even know that conversion. Um, and I'm a John Denver fan too, and I know grandma's feather bed, but I didn't know that conversion. So there we go. So one bolt has 200 meters squared. Um, what else? We know that there's 0 0.3048 um, meters in a foot. So if we square all that, that gives us this conversion factor. And then they told us that you need 31.5 square feet for one chair. So that's right here. Okay, so let's get it set up. Uh, da, 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 da. What do we start with? Um, okay, yeah, sorry. Where we're starting is got three bolts of fabric and we want to figure out how many chairs. Okay, so let's go on the next page. I've got some room over here. You can see that I put all my conversion factors in the bottom right so I don't get confused. And we'll start out with our three bolts of fabric, right? That's what we're starting with. That's what we're given. Okay, we have three bolts from our Dutch supplier. I guess the, the fact that they're Dutch is very important. Anyhow, in the first conversion that we're going to use is this one right here. We know that in one bolt, one bolt, we have 200 meters squared. So now we're getting closer to where we want to be because we've eliminated the units of bolts. Now we want to convert, if we were to stop here, we would have our answer in meters squared. But we want to convert that to feet squared because we know that you need 31 and a half square feet for one chair. And so for that step, we're going to use this conversion factor shown right here. And so let's put that in here. We know that we have 0 0.3048, we have to square all that, meters squared in one foot squared. I have a note here. I already went ahead and squared this myself. This is equal to 0 0.09290. Anyhow, so that's what this thing would equal when you when you square it. Anyhow, but you would end up with meters squared and you can see that now we've eliminated what? Meters squared and meters squared and we have square feet. So now we just need the last, the very last conversion, which is that in one chair, one chair, we have 31 and a half square feet. Look at that, it's not magic. Now we've gotten rid of feet squared and we have our final answer. And this one I already went ahead and did it. I already went ahead and multiplied this out because I said I'll make a mistake if I try to do it live. And I ended up with 205 chairs. That's a lot of kablingi. How much do you sell a chair for? I don't know, it's a completely upholstered maybe Maybe 500 bucks, so 500 times 205 chairs. It sounds like $100,000 to me. It's not so expensive. Could be. I don't know, Gage. I don't know why that was so important to our author, but um, I'm going to assume that Madam Silverberg, Dr. Silverberg, she knows more than me, so maybe that's important. 
All right. And anyhow, if you want to see the solution worked out step by step by step, which is a perfectly legitimate way to do it, I have it in here in my slides for you to look at on your own time. Let's switch gears and talk about density. Density is what we call an intensive property because it doesn't matter the amount of a substance, whether you have one gram of gold or if you have a thousand tons of gold, which I don't think there's such thing. But anyhow, if you had, you know, a ton of gold, either way, the density doesn't change, right? If you have one gram of water or whether you have 1000 grams of water, the density of water doesn't change. So it says here that density, the formula for density is density is equal to mass over volume. And I like to simplify that. And I'm sure some of you have seen D is equal to M over V like that. It says here, at a given temperature and pressure, the density of a substance is characteristic, is a characteristic physical property and has a specific value. I bet you that many of you have taken a science class, maybe at another university or maybe at this university or maybe in high school. And you've probably heard that the density of, and I'll use an uppercase doesn't matter. Um, let me just use it lower. The density of water is 1.00 grams per milliliter, right? Which is the same thing as 1.00 grams per centimeter cubed. I bet you've heard that a lot of places. Well, what you have to remember is that density, density depends on temperature and pressure. So if we have water that's, you know, let's say at 50 degrees Celsius, it's not going to have a density of exactly 1.00 grams per milliliter, okay? So you have to be aware that density changes under different, or it varies at different temperatures and pressure. All right, let's move on from there and take a look at some common substances densities. Uh, where we should we start? What's the footnote here? Okay, there is a footnote, good. So it says at the bottom, one place you got to read the fine print first. It says that these densities, right, are at 20 degrees Celsius and atmospheric pressure. So this would be sea level, sea level, um, sea level pressure. Let's take a look at water first. So the density of water is pretty close to one, 0 0.998 grams per centimeter cube. But then if you take something like hydrogen, right, it's got a much lower density, right? What what do they have in common, right? We're talking about the, the mass in one centimeter cube, right? So hydrogen is much, much lighter than water. It's much lighter than air. And that's why hydrogen balloons float, right? That's why the Hindenburg was so good at floating. Now, it doesn't explain why it exploded. That's something else. That's combustion. But anyhow, you can see that the density of grain alcohol, which is the same kind of alcohol that you find in alcoholic beverages like Coors Light, Okay, has a density that's a little bit lower than water. What else? Um, you look at something like gold. Has anybody ever seen a movie, you know, where the, the, the crooks or something or the thieves are loading gold bars into a truck? And you, they're like grabbing one gold bar at a time and they're like, oh, these gold bars are so heavy. Because you look at a gold bar and you think, that doesn't look that heavy, right? But the density of gold is almost 20 times more than water. So gold is very heavy per unit, right? Per, per unit volume compared to something like water. Okay, while, while I'm teaching, I have an inner monologue just like anybody else. And I was just trying to think, what's the den densest element? I think, now you know, don't, I'm recording this, so it's, it's gonna be a record of it, but I think it's osmium. Osmium might be the densest element. You might have to Google that one. Anyhow, let's move on from there. Okay. It's definitely not lead. Lead can't be the densest element because lead is about half as dense as gold, and gold is an element. All right. Let's take a look at a question here. It says lithium, a soft. It is osmium. Hey, what do you know? I know. That. All right. All right. Um, where are we? Lithium, a soft gray solid with the lowest density of any metal. Is a key component of advanced batteries like lithium ion batteries. A slab of lithium weighs 1.49 times 10 to the 3 milligrams and has sides that are 20.9 millimeters by 11.1 millimeters and 11.9 millimeters. Boy, they couldn't make these units easy, could they? Find the density of lithium in grams per centimeter cube. Good gravy. Okay. Um, anyhow, do we even need all this stuff here? 
Anyhow, here's the roadmap if you need it. Um, and maybe you do if you um, if you don't uh, remember, you know, some of the conversions that we've looked at. So we're going to need this conversion that in one centimeter, there's 10 millimeters. What else? That in one milligram, there's 10 to the negative three grams. I don't, again, I'm not wild about those. I like to say it like this, that in one gram, there's a thousand milligrams. I find that easier to work with numbers that are greater than one. Uh, and then we're just going to use our density formula. Good grief. Anyhow, let's, let's do it. This is, what they, this is why they pay me $3 an hour, right? So we're going to convert all of these. We're going to convert all of these um, lengths into centimeters, okay? And then we're going to convert the mass into grams because we want our density. It even asks for it in grams per centimeter cube. All right, let's give it a go. So our volume is going to be equal to... 11.1 um, millimeters by 11.9 millimeters by 20.9 millimeters. Hey, this is one time when I'm going to ask you guys, could we do a little bit of mental math, right? Could we try and convert all of these into centimeters, right? If there are 10 centimeters or 10 millimeters in one centimeter, right? All I have to do is divide all of these numbers that I have highlighted in yellow by 10, and I'll get the number of centimeters, right? I'll show you an example. I don't want to go too fast. If I have 20.9 millimeters, right, and I know that there's 10 millimeters in one centimeter, right, I end up with 2.09 centimeters. Okay? So our volume is going to be equal to 2.09 centimeters multiplied by 1.11 centimeters multiplied by 1.19 centimeters, like that. Let me grab the old. Calculatrice here, that's French for calculator. I think I spilled something on my calculator and the decimal button doesn't work. 1.19. Anyhow, you punch that in your calculator and you end up with 2.76 centimeters cubed, right? We're going to use our formula D is equal to M over V. We've already solved for V. We're done. Okay, we got that part. Now we need M. And our mass is given to us in milligrams. So let's convert it into grams. And let's do it like this. So our mass, we start with 1.49 times 10 to the power of 3 migs or milligrams. And we know that there's 1,000 milligrams in 1 gram. Milligrams cancel like that. And we end up with 1.49 grams and now we have solved for our mass. So now we just plug those numbers into our formula. So our density is going to be equal to 1.49 grams divided by 2.76 centimeters cubed. And when you punch that in your calculator, you end up with 1.49 divided by 2.76. Yeah, you get zero. You get a big number. You get 0 0.53985507. I'm going to discuss um, sig figs soon, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to say it's 0 0.50540 grams per centimeter cube. What time does this class end? 10.22. Who knows? Ten forty. It ends. That's yeah. not enough. Who wants to, Who wants to go until noon? Anybody feel it? I think that's probably against the rules, but anyhow, I'm teasing. We'll, we'll, so, so Haley says no. Okay, so one person says no. We'll stop at ten forty. Rain check. <laughs> rain check. Respectfully, no. All right. Okay. Anyhow, um, let's keep moving. All right. And let's talk about temperature for a few minutes. Some inter I love this. Some interesting temperatures. I'm sure that some of you take offense to that. You're like, this is not that interesting. Well, you know, to the author of the book, it's kind of interesting. Um, anyhow, you see that the scale that's on here is the, um, the Kelvin scale, which is called the absolute temperature scale. And I'll just kind of point out a couple of things here for you. What, the freezing point of water, the freezing or melting point of water is 273 Kelvin. Um, the boiling point of water is 
373 Kelvin. And you can see some other temperatures here, like the melting point of gold, so on and so forth. And the absolute temperature scale, if you've never heard of it before, we use it a lot in chemistry class, and we use it even more in um, we use it even more in general chemistry too. So be aware of that. And if you're like, what does Kelvin mean exactly? Well, the reason why the Kelvin um, or the absolute temperature scale is so important is because there are no negative values. You know, you can have negative Fahrenheit, negative Celsius, but there are no negative values in the Kelvin scale or the absolute temperature scale. And zero Kelvin is the lowest possible temperature that can be attained. And you're like, what? Can it be lower than that? No, you can't go lower than absolute zero. In fact, nobody has ever, um, nobody has ever achieved absolute zero. You've come close, but nobody's ever achieved absolute zero. And you're like, what's the significance of absolute zero? What's so special about it? Well, that's kind of a long subject, but to make it quick, I'll just say that that is the temperature at which all molecular and atomic motion ceases. So matter will not move at all at absolute zero, but again, it's never been obtained. And you're like, wow, that's kind of weird. But anyhow, that's the way it is. All right, so freezing and boiling points of water. This is just to, again, give you some perspective on the temperature scales of, where are they here? We got, uh, we got uh, the Celsius and the Kelvin and the Fahrenheit. So zero degrees Celsius is the freezing point of water. I told you that 273 Kelvin is the freezing point of water. Sometimes we use 273.15. So we add those two um, digits in the end in the tenths and one hundredths place. I like to add those in to have more significant figures. What else? You can see that the difference between, or the, um, the unit of a degree Celsius and the unit of a Kelvin are identical, right? If, if, it, if the temperature goes up by one Kelvin, it goes up by one degree Celsius, right? You see, if you go from 273 to 373, it's the same thing as zero to 100, right? The difference between 373 and 273 is 100. Whereas Fahrenheit, now that's just wacky. It's all over the place, right? Anyhow, um, yeah, so that gives you a little bit of perspective on those temperatures. So the absolute temperature scale or the Kelvin scale begins at absolute zero, only has positive values, no negative values. Note that there's no degree sign, so we don't call it degrees Kelvin. It's just simply Kelvin, right? It's like Cher or Madonna. Okay, it's just Kelvin. Then we have um, degrees Celsius, so the Celsius scale is based on the freezing and boiling points of water. I should add that that's at, um, at sea level, at one atmosphere of pressure. Um, but again, in the, in the States, we use the Fahrenheit scale. And um, yeah, does anybody know what other countries use the Fahrenheit scale? There are two of them. This has got nothing to do with chemistry, does it? We can give ourselves a brain break for a second. So one person put Myanmar, that's right. Myanmar and Liberia, hot diggity there, and you guys got it, you nailed it. All right, there we go. So Myanmar is the same thing as Burma, great, yeah. Anyhow, so let's move on from there. So are you guys ready for some formulas that you're gonna have to have memorized? Okay, so let me help you out. 10.26 in the morning, you're like, Mr. Dion, can't you just make it come to a screeching halt? No, okay, so you're gonna have to memorize one of these. One of these, and you will have to have these memorized for the first exam. And one of these. Um, these. The good news is the one that I have with the red next to it is very easy to remember. So if you want to convert temperature in Kelvin from temperature in degrees Celsius, all you do is add 273.15. Not much of a stretch there. And I'm sure that everybody can rearrange that formula to solve for temperature in degrees Celsius. Now for the other two, I think it's probably handiest to just memorize one of them. I usually encourage students to memorize this one right here. And then um, you can just solve this one for temperature in degrees Celsius to get this formula here. Okay, so if we wanna convert from temperature in degrees Celsius to temperature in Fahrenheit, what I have in the yellow box, what you do is you multiply that temperature in degrees Celsius by nine over five, and then you add 32 to it, okay? Conversely, if you want to convert from Fahrenheit to degrees Celsius, you're gonna take the temperature in Fahrenheit, subtract 32, and multiply by the reciprocal, which is five over nine. All right, well, with that in mind, well, let's give it a try here and do a problem. 
no better way to learn chemistry than to start to pee and just rack this. That's right, practice. So it says here, a child has a body temperature of 38.7 degrees Celsius, and the normal body temperature is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Does the child have a fever? What is the child's temperature in Kelvin? All right, I have the solution there. So let's work it out as a group. And again, I I'm not insane. I don't expect you to memorize the formula in you know 60 seconds. So I'm going to write down the formula for you. And the formula that we're going to use is what I had on the previous slide. We need the temperature in Fahrenheit. So temperature in degrees Fahrenheit is equal to the temperature in degrees Celsius multiplied by 9 over 5. We're going to do this part first. And then we're going to add 32 to that. So now let's plug in some numbers. So we're going to say our temperature in degrees Fahrenheit is equal to 38.7 multiplied by 9 over 5. And then we add 32. You should be aware of the order of operations, which is bed mass, brackets, exponents, division, multiplication, addition, subtraction. So we're going to do the bracket first. And so we end up with 60, what is it, 69.7, 69.7 plus 32, and that gives us 101.7 degrees Fahrenheit, like that. Does the child have a fever? Absolutely it does, right? Because 107, 101.7, ooh, 107, that would be even worse, right, is greater than 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. So, yes. Yes, of uh, Eva. And the only prescription is more chemistry. And so now we want to convert that child's temperature into Kelvin. And I think the easiest way to do that is to use a formula that was on the previous slide, which is the temperature in Kelvin is equal to the temperature in degrees Celsius plus 273.15. And so we're going to put in 38.7 degrees Celsius plus 273.15 and we end up with 311.8 Kelvin. Comes up. Say in French. All right. There you have it. Give me a thumbs up if you think you could do that. The old temperature conversion. This is where it would be more fun to be together in a room. See, So Blake says he can. All right. If Blake can do it, we're going to have to keep Moving along. All right. It's fun stuff, temperature conversion. You can impress your friends. All right. Impress a loved one. I think you turn your mic off. I don't know if that's on purpose. Can you hear me now? Yes, you're right. good now. Sorry, I don't. That's the first time that's ever happened. Wow. Thanks. Thanks for thanks for telling me. Appreciate it. OK, great. The joys of taking university on. It's not online. It's remote. It's not online. Remote, not the same thing. Okay. Yeah, the joys of studying chemistry remotely. Oh boy. Okay, let's talk about what are called extensive and intensive properties. What I was saying before I probably muted my mic is I said this is kind of uh, what I think is one of the simpler concepts we look at. I don't like to use the word simple and chemistry in the same sentence because it's not simple, but um, I think it's manageable. So extensive properties are dependent on the amount of a substance that you have, okay? So things like mass, you can have one kilogram of water, 10 kilograms of water, right? So on and so forth. Um, volume as well. These, again, length, right? You could add length to that one if you wanted to. Um, let's throw it in there. Length depends on the amount that you have. Whereas intensive properties are independent of the amount of a substance that you have. For example, things like density. We could add other things to this one. 
I would also put in here like color, right? If you have one brick that has a color or you have a thousand bricks, the same color, right? It doesn't matter how many you have. I'd also add things like hardness. These are things that I just had written in my notes. Also melting and boiling points. So melting, boiling points, right? What's the boiling point of water? 100 degrees Celsius. You don't say, what's the boiling point of one liter of water? Because you're like, well, it doesn't matter how much water you have. It always boils at the same temperature. Okay. Um, other things that we will never look at in this class, I'm just throwing this out there because I know many of you are probably interested in taking as many chemistry classes as you can. You're like, this is only my second chemistry lecture, and I just love it so much. Probably going to switch my major. So there's also things like refractive index, refractive index, which is the ability of a compound to bend light. Anyhow, that would also be considered an intensive property, something we'll never look at in this class, but I just want to throw it out there at you. Okay, so you have to be aware of what extensive and intensive properties are, and you have to be able to follow me if I use those words in a lecture. Well, with that in mind, let me switch gears again, because this chapter is kind of a review of many different concepts. And let's kind of try to finish up the lecture talking about significant figures. And if I don't get through it, I'm going to expect you to read the rest of it yourself. But let's get started here. So significant figures it says here that every measurement, when you measure something, whether it's with your bathroom scale or a graduated cylinder or whatever, volumetric pipette, every measurement includes some uncertainty. The rightmost digit of any quantity is always estimated. So you're like, what does it mean by rightmost? What that means is let's say you had, you know, you had a measurement of 10.2424 milliliters, right? Which one of those digits is the rightmost? It's this one here. So it means that that number four, that was estimated, okay? What if you had something like, um, let's say you had a mass that was, you know, 101 point, uh, I'm not very imaginative here, am I? 101.7 grams, okay? You can assume that that rightmost digit has been estimated, but it's still considered a significant figure. So it says here, recorded digits, whether they are certain or uncertain. So that means that rightmost one still counts, whether they're certain or uncertain. We call those significant figures, and oftentimes I'll just call them sig figs, for sure, they don't pay me enough to say significant and figures every time. The greater number of significant figures in a quantity, the greater its certainty. The number of significant figures in a measurement. So here we have two types of thermometers. Okay, we have, let's start with this one over here um, on the right. And this is just an expansion. And you can see that the mercury in that thermometer is right here and we always read from the meniscus whether it's concave or convex and this one is convex okay and so you can see that the line is right around here jeepers mr dion needs a new prescription bad anyhow it's like above this line here so this is 30 um 31 this is 31 this is 32 so it's above the 32 so it looks like it's about a third of the way between here and here, right? So that means it's around 32.3 degrees Celsius. Now that, remember, we estimated that digit, okay? What I always tell my students in nursing chemistry is the mantra is um, uh, estimate one digit past the smallest calibration. Now this, this thermometer was purchased at Walmart, okay? The thermometer on the left, no, 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 no. That thermometer on the left, that is from Target, okay? The store that, you know, I walk into Target, alarms start going off, like you can't afford to shop here, buddy, you don't earn enough, blah, blah, blah. Okay, Target, a very expensive store. This is a fancy, fancy thermometer because there are more increments marked on that thermometer. Whereas this thermometer, you see it went up by 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, so on and so forth. This one goes up. 32.1, 32.2, 32.3, 32.4, 32 32 32 32.5, right? It's got way more gradations, okay? And so when we're reading the meniscus on this thermometer, okay, right here, like that, 
you can see that it's above 32.123. It's above 32.3, and it looks like it's about a third of the way between here and here. Okay, it's kind of hard to see it the way that I've done it. But anyhow, we have an extra significant digit. And so when you have more gradations on your instrument, your, what you're using to do your measurements, you're going to have more significant figures. All right. Pretty cool, huh? So that's why it's important to have, you know, sometimes it's important to have more accurate glassware or a thermometer or a scale or whatever. Right. OK, here we go. So it's almost 1040. Now, and where are we? All right, so I'm unsure as to what I'm going to do next. We have class on Friday and we're going to talk about chapter two and chapter three, but I might. Um, how come I can't turn my camera on? There we go. Go to application. But either we're going to spend some time in class talking about significant figures, or I might make a short video about significant figures if there's time. Anyhow, we'll call it a day for there. And um, so if I was you, what would I be working on? Reading all of the chapters in the textbook. You pay a lot for textbooks. They're not cheap. And so I recommend, you know, using those or using that. Um, I would start doing some practice problems from the back of the book. And there you go. I would start working on my learn smarts, homeworks, and making sure that you are keeping up with things. All right. So I will post this recording. Um, to my YouTube channel under the playlist that is Chemistry 1401 Fall 20, and I'll put the link on Canvas as well. Have a nice day. Thank you.